Do you want our viewers to hear this? Yes. Can you play it? Please remove you. This is Dominique. OK, can I speak to the supervisor on the um, ex-protective charge from the police? OK. So just so you understand, Triple Zero is a, an emergency call centre? I understand that. It's been recorded and that's exactly what I want. OK, what was your name? Ashley Bryant. Ashley, I can't transfer you to a supervisor because there's no need to. OK. All right, well, I'm about to take my life. And why, mate? What's happened to make you cause, cause you to do that? I understand this is being recorded and I, I suffer post-traumatic stress disorder. It's heartbreaking. But I didn't blame him. Um because I knew that that wasn't really him. And I sympathised with him. But um, I just always lived in hope that things would get better. Post-traumatic stress disorder, or PTSD, is a mental illness that will strike one in five police officers. It's a silent killer that cops are reluctant to talk about and governments are reluctant to deal with. It's frightening, the amount of people who've got it, and the fact that they're out there doing such a dangerous job, not only armed with their firearm, but they're armed with this, this, this thing, this condition that's just so overwhelming, and they're gonna snap. Putting their lives on the line to serve and protect comes at a high price. Cops kill themselves, they suicide because of PTSD. So let's not pretend it doesn't happen. Port Macquarie on the New South Wales mid-north coast was a great place for a kid to grow up in the 70s and Ashley Bryant loved it. Summer breeze makes me feel fine. He was a nipper at the local surf club. After leaving school, Ashley joined the police force and landed a plum job at Manly Police Station. I was working at Monavale Hospital, uh, so a group of uh, female nurses went along to Monavale Christmas Ball uh, and I met Ash there and we were together ever since. Deb Newton was a 22-year-old nurse when she met Ashley. Two years later, they were married. So these are shots of our um, trip overseas when we went over to Europe and we had a fantastic time. That was back in um, 1998. When we first met, you know, he was really vibrant and loved life, loved what he did, just was really positive about everything. And then having kids, that would have been, you know, like for all couples, kind of brings you much closer. Yeah, it's a pretty special time, yeah. Hey, Joe. Oh. And he was a good dad. Yeah. Yeah, he was a good fun dad. <laughs> he loved his job. He did, and he was good at his job. So good that in 2007, Ashley was assigned to the newly created Unsolved Homicide Squad. Police believe she was locking up her yellow Gemini and probably never saw her killer sneak up... His first night. cold case was the baffling and brutal 1984 rape and murder of Sydney restaurant hostess Joanne Hattie. Using DNA evidence, Ashley and his team sent this man, David Fleming, to prison for 21 years and delivered justice for Joanne's family. Ashley was a good cop, relentless and determined to solve his cases, a real perfectionist. He was also very sensitive and caring with grieving victims and their families. But all the human tragedy he witnessed was slowly taking its toll. Uh, even from the beginning, uh, you know, in the early days, there was always incidents that he would come home and was obviously very affected by whether it be motor vehicle accidents or um, self-harm, suicides. Um, he had tears rolling down his face. In 2008, Ashley was promoted to detective sergeant in the New South Wales country town of Burke. The whole family packed up and headed west, but Ashley's PTSD followed. Ash drove past in his work four-wheel drive and stopped and saw us and 
he was clearly upset then and he'd just seen a young girl, not much older than our daughter at the time, who'd been run over by a car. And I felt that he needed to get help. But he didn't want to do that because he didn't want anyone to know that he wasn't coping. It was really heartbreaking to see that strong person become a shell of himself. Post-traumatic stress disorder is a, a psychiatric condition which is um, experienced by people who've had horrific events happen to them. And we're not talking about day-to-day -day stresses here. We're talking about people who've witnessed deaths or been involved in life-threatening accidents. Professor Sandy McFarlane is a psychiatrist who spent 30 years treating police officers suffering from PTSD as a result of their work. If you're confronted with that sort of thing in your day-to-day -day work repeatedly, you can imagine there comes a point when it becomes intolerable. The human mind can only tolerate so much reality. Um, and, and I think that's the issue, that there comes a point when you actually can't do it anymore. What we normally do for anyone that hasn't been before, we just normally go around the room and just um, introducing yourself and a little bit about, you, you know, your own experience without getting too graphic. Once a month, every month, for the last nine years, Esther McKay makes sure there's a safe place for damaged cops to go and help each other. It just brought up a lot of issues with work and isolation. She was a dedicated cop for 21 years, most of it as a forensic crime scene investigator, until she was medically discharged with PTSD in 2000. And from that stage, um, I realised that I was going to lose my career, which was quite devastating. And I think um, when you talk to police, you'll see that commonality. They love their job. Uh, it's, it's a real passion. I just lost the plot and uh, it was uh, incomprehensible. I got to a stage where I was effectively negotiating with myself not to jump off a cliff. These are all former police officers whose lives have been crippled by their on-the-job experiences. I was a police officer for 32 years and uh, it, uh, when you look back, uh, I think we did a bloody good job with very little. You're right. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm okay. I'm just just thinking of things yeah. I've done. Yeah. I'm getting bloody emotional. Right, right. <laughs> First time in years. I'm a person who uh, I say has recovered from PTSD and depression. So my, um, my story is a little bit different in many regards. In over 20 years as a cop, Alan Sparks experienced the extremes of the job. As the hunt for a suspected terror group goes on. He attended the fatal Hilton Hotel bombing in 1978. They were shot dead by John. Was one of the first at the scene of the 1995 double murder of two policemen. One of them, a good mate. With the rain forecast to continue. And then in 1996, he and his partner put their lives on the line in a dramatic rescue. They received Australia's highest civilian bravery award, the Cross of Valour, for plunging into a flooded stormwater pipe to save a young boy who was drowning. And there's a manhole in the road, and we look down and water's bubbling up, and the screams of this kid are coming up through the water. This child's dying, these screams are just horrific. With ropes tied around them, Alan and his partner go down the manhole. So there's water cascading on top of us. It's dark, the roar of this water's going around. And it was like, God, where is he? Where in the hell is this kid? And then finally in, in my torchlight, I saw the, this little white face, you know, this ghostly-like image of this kid. And I just wrapped him up in my arms and said, yeah, you say, thank you, God. And he just started bawling his eyes out. They saved the boy, but the high-risk rescue pushed Alan over the edge. His wife, Deb, also a police officer, found him at the station. Deb found me just curled up in the fetal position in the bottom of the shower, just sobbing my heart out. I turned off the taps and literally got down into the sort of bottom of the, the wet... Um, uh, shower stall and just sort of wrap my arms around him. 
Alan celebrated that night, but after a few weeks back at work, he hit rock bottom. I went to work and got my gun out with the intention of going to shoot myself. And a workmate walked in and um, I think he realised something wasn't quite right. And I gave him, gave him my gun and just said, take me home. And that was the last day that I ever uh, worked as an operational police officer. Alan was diagnosed with PTSD and after a decade of therapy is now better. During that time, a colleague he once worked with, Ashley Bryant, was getting worse. Ash wasn't somebody who sat behind a desk for his career. Ash was a really good cop, a really proactive, good, dedicated police officer whose life got to the state of absolute despair and desperation. Detective Sergeant Ashley Bryant, a father of three, was now stationed in Ballina on the New South Wales north coast. But he was reaching breaking point. Is, is that enough? Yeah, that's enough. We had a beautiful home up there. We had a five acre sort of hobby farm. And, you know, the kids had motorbikes and it was lots of fun. It was an absolutely beautiful place to live. And I guess every time you move, there's always this perception that everything's going to be better. But then the realities of jobs came in and it ended up being the same. And over time, he confided in me that he had considered suicide. In January 2012, Ashley took three months sick leave and a psychiatrist diagnosed him with PTSD. Antidepressants and sleeping tablets didn't help. He found it was that he could get to sleep easier with alcohol. Neither did three weeks in a rehab facility. So in December that year, after 23 years in the job, he told his boss he couldn't go on. Did the decision to resign make him feel better or worse? No, it made him feel much, much worse. From my point of view, I was really, really happy that he had finally taken that step and he was devastated. Unemployed, Ashley applied for a disability pension, but there was a delay with his claim. Deb found a job in Port Macquarie and the whole family moved once more. In May of 2013, he had a received a letter from one of his insurers telling him that his claim for total and permanent disability had been knocked back. And that affected him greatly. That just began a downhill spiral. So things became really, really difficult at home again. And so he felt that it would be better if he moved away. A week after Ashley moved out, he had an appointment to see a psychologist and Deb wanted to be there with him. During that appointment, uh, we discussed him going back to the rehab centre and again he refused to do that. And at that point he stood up and just said, I can't do this anymore and he left. When Deborah left the appointment here in Coffs Harbour, she had a two-hour drive south home to Port Macquarie and she thought Ashley was on his way back to Lismore about an hour and a half north. But instead, Ashley drove here to Minion Falls three and a half hours north, a really beautiful but isolated picnic spot, way up in the hills, inland from Byron Bay. And he sat in the car and he made his final calls. First to his brother, and then he spoke to Deb's mum, telling them he was at Minion Falls. But neither could talk him out of what he was planning. And then he made his last call. He made a phone call to Triple O and he spoke to the operator there and he asked to speak to the supervisor. Can I ask why you got hold of it? Because I needed to hear it for myself. I 
I understand this is being recorded and I I suffer post-traumatic stress disorder. I, I can no longer live with the trauma of it. Okay. And and I want this to go to the coroner. Right. There needs to be more more, more things put in place for what hard for, listen for the partners of those that suffer. I suffer. Yeah. And so so do the partners. And it has to be more done for them. Okay. Um, all right, I have no more to say. And so you're at Minion Force. And mate, can, are you able to wait for the police to get there? No, I'll be gone before they arrive. Thank you. Can you please at least... It's a beautiful spot. You can see straight down the valley to Byron Bay and the lookout from the platform is just spectacular. When I knew that he was there, I knew what he was going to do. Why, why do you think he made that final step? I don't know how he could do that. I don't know how you... I don't know how things can be so bad that you can do that. I don't understand that. Police forces don't release figures for the number of serving or retired police officers who have taken their lives as a result of PTSD. But in New South Wales alone, in the last two years, over five times as many retired and serving officers died by their own hand than were killed in the line of duty. The statistics are not kept properly. You know, if I was the police commissioner, I would be wanting to know about this. You're losing highly competent and skilled people uh, and we, if, we, if you don't measure it and understand just how many people find themselves in these circumstances, you don't do anything about it. Hopefully in time things will change because they really do need to change because it's just heartbreaking to see it go on and on and it's been going on for years and it needs to stop. A police officer is crouching on the back tray of a stolen ute Holding on for dear life, as it speeds through the centre of Sydney, he radios for help. I'm in the back of a stolen vehicle. They're heading uh, east towards George Street. Constable Jeff Garland is trying to arrest the driver and passenger and trying to stay alive. Did you say you were in this vehicle? I'm in the train to back... He was slamming the foot in the brakes, he was swerving over the road, he was ramming parked cars. I thought, I'm going to die here. They're going through the park. Got this right it out. I can't shoot him here, there's too many people. It was peak hour traffic, 8.30 on a Monday morning. With a vehicle being driven through the park. The passenger jumped out, he was scared, and I've just got my gun and smashed my gun through the back window. Held it against his head. I said, mate, stop him, or I'm going to shoot you. He's taken off the car, still spinning around. I've jumped out, started chasing him. Put it with one hand, gun in the other hand. He jumps the fence. I try to, I couldn't get over it. Jeff doesn't know if the car thief is armed. The man dashes across the street into a nearby building. I don't know if it's calm or what it is, but of all the buildings to run into this city, he's run into a building full of police. It was terrifying at the time. My wife said to me, if you do that again, I'll kill you. So for you, that was the straw that broke the camel's back? That was it. It was the day that one all... I had a lot of incidents before that. Um, and that was like, I can't do this anymore. Jeff had been a policeman for five years. He was based in Redfern, where in a short time, he experienced a lifetime of danger and violence. I used to be a very happy-go-lucky sort of person. Um, I know that I changed a lot when I was, when I was in the police. Um, I'd be involved in a major incident, and then I'd come to work the next day and I'd break down crying, or I'd go to work and I'd sit out in my car and I'd cry. And I'd be late for work, so I'd be sitting in the car and I'd be crying because I didn't want to go in. I couldn't do it anymore. But I had to be strong because I'm a policeman. That's what I'm supposed to do. Jeff hoped to move up the coast in 2002 to a quieter posting would save his career. 
But the daily trauma of frontline policing didn't go away. There was just no rest. It was like bang, 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 bang. And it just, just, just got too much. I just thought that I wasn't coping and I could tell I wasn't coping. I was crying at work, I was avoiding work. I couldn't go near a police station. I couldn't wear police uniform. And that's Harper, my wife's a police officer too. Two, three, go! And then it all Lisa. got too much. I remember one time when I just, I had enough. I wanted to just to go away. I didn't know what I was going to do. I just wanted to go away. No, 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 no. <laughs> and I dropped my girls off and my three-year-old daughter was at the window and she's going, Daddy, Daddy, don't go. And it's like, I... I don't know how she knew, I don't know, but she's at the window, knocking on the window, saying, Daddy, Daddy, don't go. And I don't, I don't know how she knew, but it just like, that was it. No, I wasn't gonna do it, no. Jeff knew he needed help. He was medically discharged from the police force in 2011, and with the help of his wife, Rachel, and intensive counselling, he's well on the road to recovery. But Jeff worries about the many police men and women who aren't getting help. It's frightening, the amount of people who've got it, and the fact that they're out there doing such a dangerous job, not only armed with their firearm, but they're armed with this, this, this thing, this condition that's just so overwhelming. And it can get to the stage where they're going to snap, where they could end up taking their own life. Adding to the stress of police suffering PTSD are the hurdles they're forced to go through to make workers' compensation or disability claims. In 2012, the New South Wales government awarded the contract to a different insurance company. And the result has seen delays in processing existing cases and a decrease in the number of new ones. The government actually are the people who are injuring these people uh, and they should face the consequence of that injury rather than simply trying to limit the costs to them financially. Jeff Garland's treatment by insurance giant MetLife eventually forced him to abandon his disability claim, which would have helped support his young family. You had to keep seeing all these specialists. You had to keep going over everything. And I had to go through every incident, every emotion, how I was feeling, how it impacted upon me, and it was hard. Did they spy on you? Yeah. I saw this car at the front of my house and I, mean, I know the car's in my street. I know who it is, I know where it was parked. It shouldn't be parked there being a policeman, you have these senses sort of thing. So, yeah, I was just taking my family out and we drove past it slowly to have a look. And there was a, a guy in the back seat of his car with a camera, he was following us, just pointed straight at us and he was trying to hide. How did it feel being surveilled and videoed? It was hard enough, the fact that I, I, I lost my job that I had to deal with the stuff I was going through, that I should not be treated like a criminal, that I, that I had done something wrong. The covert tactics used by the insurance company wore Jeff down, and finally, he gave up. I didn't want to always be looking over my shoulder as to them recording me. I mean, I felt like a failure. And I hear I had this insurance company following me around, making me feel worse, making me look over my shoulders, because. Occasionally I'd have a good day, so I could go outside and spend time with the family and friends. And hey, if I was laughing, they think, may think that I, was, that I was better, that I was cured and that they could refuse my claim. And I didn't want that hanging over me, and that's what a lot of police are going through. Police officers like Ashley Bryant. Before his suicide, he'd fought an ongoing battle for workers' compensation with two insurance companies. And his disability claim was rejected by state authority super. The whole insurance system affected him so badly that he just felt completely helpless. And he didn't think that there was an end in sight. Did that break him all over again? Absolutely. It was... It was... the nail in the coffin, so to speak. It's true. Every, every word, it's just... The sacrifice he made was so that other people didn't have to go through it. And it shouldn't have to get to that. The insurance companies are making it so much worse because all they want to do is save a dollar. I just pray to God that his death will not be in vain. That his death will be able to save other lives. There needs to be more, more, more things put in place for partners of those that suffer. 
I come up here, and so so do the partners. There has to be more done for them. They know that if they actually put their hand up and say that they're not coping, that they're not going to get su the support that they need. And that's what Ash was trying to change. And I'm really, really proud of him for doing that. His last moment, he's thinking of everyone else.